be praised. Amen. Thank you. I want to say thank you. Uh, lots of things get done that uh, people don't see. <laughs> and I just continue to be amazed. And I want to say thank yous uh, for all the help with the many tasks that make our sanctuary and grounds clean and beautiful. And to everyone who helps with uh, the food. Uh, just a reminder, after our service, we have a fellowship time downstairs. And people bring stuff to share and to snack on and to enjoy. And I thank you for those who, who come with that. Those who help with the technology, people like Bill and David, thank you for your work with uh, uh, technology, video, and sound. And it doesn't just happen. Somebody has to do it, and so thank you for, for that help. And Lois, we always appreciate your helping us with the uh, piano and, and uh, D Jen back there with her fiddle. Uh, we love that when she's uh, playing that too. Thank you. And I want to give my congratulations again to our graduates uh, yesterday. Uh, Mel hosted a party at his place that was a lot of fun. Uh, Michelle and I made it over there and one of the most fun things was to watch the uh, hopping along and the, uh, uh, it wasn't really a three-legged race, but they had like, uh, they, were, <laughs> they had like sacks and they were racing. It was really fun to watch them fall down. <laughs> so uh, well done, congratulations graduates and uh, the scripture says, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. They'll be life for you. Take the word of God with you. Just Amen. a correction on that. I, I didn't host the party. My daughter, uh, Shannon, and her boyfriend okay. did 90% of it. Yes. I, I was just an attendee for a change. I, wasn't, I, I enjoyed the food, which was spectacular, but I, I, had, I really had very little to do with it this year. Okay, uh, nice. Thanks to everyone that did do something there. It was amazing. And again, uh, congratulations. Uh, this coming week, we have an elders meeting Monday at 7, and we have a weekly men's breakfast that everyone's invited to at 7.30 Saturdays at Casey's in Plasto. Uh, starting very soon, uh, we're going to have a Friday night movie night at the Parsonage, and come, come have a good time. We're going to uh, there'll always be some nice snacks to enjoy. I'm looking forward to that. And fellowship and an inspiring time together. So the first one's going to be Friday the 13th at 6, and you're all invited. You can bring your friends. If we can squeeze them in, we'll just do it, and we'll have a great time. You're not sure on Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> and some, uh, just the, in your calendars, uh, board meeting the 26th, and then the elders and subsequent meetings, and I'll just keep us abreast of that. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. I'd like to call your attention to our scripture reading this morning, and our, our study is going to be from John chapter 3. And here is uh, the word of God. May we just give it our full undivided attention. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, 
so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. There's just a little bit of a ring in, Bill, if you can help with that. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Amen and Lord bless this reading of his word. My message this morning is entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Saved? What does it mean to be saved? And we'll talk about the way of salvation. And how it... Let me start with this big question. Is someone we would consider a good person in good standing with God? Is someone who we would consider a good person in good standing with God? Or to put it another way, would that person have eternal life because they're a good person? Or you could say, would go to heaven? Now, this is a question most people have an opinion on. But many people outside the church and some inside the church may not be very clear on this question. What does the Bible say about it? And so this morning I want to try to answer this question for all of us. And this passage of John's Gospel, I think, answers our question. Our scripture reading this morning came from John chapter 3. And John introduces us to this Pharisee named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, what a man. He was a good man. He loved God. He did everything he could to obey God. He became a Pharisee, very zealous to keep the law. And he taught as a rabbi. He did everything he could to keep and devote himself to the Old Testament scriptures, to obey them as best he could. And as we saw last week, for those who are here, in John chapter 2, in the week that Jesus came to the festival and for the Passover, Nicodemus and all the Pharisees and all the teachers and the Sanhedrin were there watching Jesus. And during this week of the Passover, Jesus performed many miracles. He did incredible signs. People watched him there at the temple healing people. And so... Nicodemus observes this, and he comes to Jesus. And John tells us about his coming to Jesus. And he came to Jesus, and he has a conversation with him that John has recorded for us here in his gospel. And this conversation helps give us understanding and the answer to this all-important question of what it is that gives us good standing with Almighty God. Notice again from our scriptures how this happened, this good man came to see Jesus, this man named, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, and he was a member of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. And he came to Jesus at night, he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. No one has ever seen signs like he was doing. The healings that he was doing Oh, they were occasionally done by prophets in the Old Testament, but now Jesus was doing them on a massive scale. Everyone had to understand and acknowledge, this isn't just anybody that can do this. This is a special person. He says, we know you have come from God. No one could do this. So during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, while Jesus is there in Jerusalem for the Passover, daily he came into the temple area and he was teaching and daily he was ministering to people and healing 
and everyone was observing this. No one had taught in such a way that was accompanied by such healing signs. Here's what it says in John chapter 2 that we covered last week. It says, Now while he was at in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Hundreds of thousands of people were there for the Passover, perhaps millions. And they saw all these signs that he was doing. And Jesus taught and he healed and he performed so many signs. And many believed. Many people saw these signs and they believed that he was the one that they were longing for, the long-awaited Messiah. Certainly no one could argue with the overwhelming evidence of the miraculous signs. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus to talk with him about it. And he asks him questions about it. The first words were, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one, no one could perform miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. These signs were seen by so many and no one had ever seen anything like it. Nicodemus affirms only God has the power to do such things. God must be working through him. But back to our question. Is being a good person, even a person who believes Jesus has come from God, is that enough to put that person in right standing with God? To give them an eternity with God? Again, do good people go to heaven? What does Jesus have to say? Notice the words spoken by Jesus to Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, no one, I put this in big print so you can see it real big, no one can see the kingdom unless he is born again. Jesus tells this very good man, a good man who believes that Jesus came from God, that even he cannot see the kingdom unless there's something more. Something more. Jesus says to see the kingdom of God, to be able to spend eternity with him, he must be born again. He must be born again. What did Jesus mean by the term born again? Well, Nicodemus didn't understand. If you had never heard that term before, never heard it before, like sort of like Nicodemus, you would wonder what he was talking about. And Nicodemus was no different. He asked Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? <laughs> So he's just thinking with common sense. How can you be born again? I'm old. How can I be born again? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. Nicodemus asks, how is it possible to be born again? And he states the obvious. Surely we can't go back <laughs> and do that again. And so Jesus answers him with clarification as we see in verses 5 and 6. Jesus answers, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus restates the absolute certainty that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless something happens and that something he calls being born again or being born from above. The second birth, though, is not a flesh birth like the first one that we all experience. The second birth is a spiritual birth. It is something that happens in the spiritual realm. Jesus said that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they have this spiritual birth. And everyone alive was born in the flesh, in the physical realm. But to enter into the kingdom... To have right standing with God the Father, something more is required. They must have this second birth, a spiritual birth. The spiritual birth comes differently. The spiritual birth comes from the Holy Spirit. In the next few verses, there's some more talk back and forth between Nicodemus and Jesus. And Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for 
he and the Pharisees' failure to accept what Jesus has been saying and listening to his message. Jesus explains to Nicodemus how this birth is possible. Notice here, he says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, in many places throughout the gospel, explains that he came for a purpose, and that purpose was to bring salvation. His purpose in coming was to bring salvation, the opportunity to be saved to mankind. We see this in his conversation with Zacchaeus, uh, where he is talking with him, and he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose. And so here in this conversation with Nicodemus, he explains how his mission to come to the earth would accomplish salvation. Jesus referred to a part of history that Nicodemus and all the teachers, the rabbis, would know very, very well. What happened there back in the wilderness when the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they began to grumble? And they were talking about going back to Egypt. And because of their disobedience, God allowed snakes, serpents, to come in to their camp and bite them. And if they uh, didn't respond the right way, they died from those bites. And so many people came to Moses and they said, we're being overrun with serpents. Help us. And so God said to Moses, I want you to put up a pole and put a bronze serpent on it. And anyone who will look to that pole in faith will be healed from the snake bite. And so all of those who were bitten and looked to the pole were saved from the snake bite. And Nicodemus knew this well. And Moses put up this pole with a serpent on it. And as people were bitten and they looked in faith, they were saved. Others who wouldn't look, they died from the snake bite. So this is something that was well known in Israel's history. And Jesus says, just like that experience, why did that happen? That happened as a picture to help people see what was coming in the future. It's totally illogical to think that looking at a bronze image could heal anyone from a snake bite, but the point was that it takes an act of faith in God's plan to find salvation and healing from sin. It takes an act of faith, an obedient act, doing what he has told us to do. So this part of Israel's history illustrated how, it, how a new birth takes place. All mankind has been bitten by the viper of sin. And we are condemned to death because of sin that is in us. The serpent of brass was a picture of the Lord Jesus, the means of salvation being lifted up on a cross. And Jesus said that he, the Son of Man, must be lifted up. He would have to be lifted up just the way the bronze serpent was lifted up. He would have to be lifted up in a sacrificial death. And by looking to him, anyone who believes in that way of salvation, believing in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus revealed that his own mission involved something that was pointed to long ago. Jesus quoted this Old Testament incident to illustrate how new birth takes place. The Lord was sinless and should have never been punished, but he willingly went to the cross and died. He willingly went in our place. What we would have deserved for our sins, the sins of mankind were placed upon Jesus, and there on the cross he bore the judgment which we deserved. The pole speaks of the cross of Calvary on which the Lord Jesus was lifted up. And like the children of Israel who looked to the serpent in faith, and were healed from their bite, so those who look to the cross in faith, trusting the work of Jesus, will be saved. Trusting in the work of Jesus and his sacrificial death is being born again. What a picture. And so in this conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus explains what it took to accomplish this work of salvation. He, he explains what it took, and we see that everyone who looked up was healed. And God used this to teach them obedience to trust in Him. 
He explains to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is maybe the most well-known verse in the Bible for, for most Christians. He explains to Nicodemus, This is God's love on display that he gave his son who would be this sacrificial lamb and offered for us. And he speaks this heavenly truth to Nicodemus. And throughout the Bible, we see this incredible picture of mercy and love of God. And time and again, God reaching out to rebellious mankind. In spite of the rebellion, God offers mercy. Our God loves us so much. He loves the world so much that he makes a way to be saved to have life eternal, to experience the joy of relationship with him. Whoever believes shall not perish, but have eternal life. Bill, I'd like to, if you can bring up, I have a little video clip. Uh, some of you have been watching The Chosen. It's a, a production of the Bible that's been going on for the past couple of years. And so as soon as you can bring it up, Bill, I'll just introduce it. Uh, they've uh, now produced two seasons. and. On uh, each of their shows, which are about uh, 45 minutes to an hour long, they take a segment of scripture and they've been working through the Gospel of John. And here I want to give you just a little video clip and uh, watch this as the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and then I'll wrap it up. This way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hey, it's Dallas, I'm the creator of The Chosen, and the scene you're about to see is the scene. The most impactful and famous chapter in the Bible, John chapter 3, the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Now, what you're about to see will not only be the gospel captured accurately, but you'll also see the historical context, the cultural context, and the personal human context that we added that was set up by the previous six episodes. So enjoy the scene as it is. But if you want to get the full impact as to why this scene was so powerful, be sure to watch the entire season one of The Chosen. Check this out. I don't know where to start. I have so many questions. I... Shall we sit first? Oh, yes. Of course. The Eastern Slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their rhetoric and fiery tongue. I've heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell a paramedic to get up and walk, much less it actually happened. So what is your conclusion? I believe you are not acting alone. No one can do these signs you do without having God in him. Only someone who has come from God. And how is that belief going over in the synagogue? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we are here at this hour. What else? you come here to show us a kingdom that is what our rulers are worried about no not that kind then what a sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again born again yes you mean like a new creature a conversion from gentile to jewish no no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? <laughs> I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, and she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit, his spirit, that part of you, that is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. 
Thank you, Kamari. Take your time. On the morning of the fifth day, we leave. And we'll meet by the well in the southern quarter. video clip from The Chosen, and if you haven't seen it, you can see why I've been encouraging you to see it. Um, it's a beautiful scene that he has uh, captured here in that moment, and Nicodemus and Jesus having this conversation together, and Jesus helping him to understand why he's come. God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And he explained there that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. What a beautiful demonstration and example of his love. One has uh, put it this way, God, the greatest lover. Maybe I can show you the little saying I have it here, but sorry, I got kind of backed out of this a little bit. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his one and only son, the greatest gift, that whoever the greatest opportunity believes the greatest simplicity in him the greatest attraction shall not perish the greatest promise but the greatest difference have the greatest certainty eternal life the greatest possession God the greatest lover with the greatest degree of love, didn't send Jesus here to condemn, but with a mission to save the world through him. Verse 17 explains that God didn't send Jesus here in his first coming to condemn the world, but he could have. <laughs> but instead, God took this opportunity to send Jesus that he might save the world through him. Oh, the love of God so rich and pure. We sang earlier this beautiful chorus, I'm forgiven because he's forsaken. I'm accepted because he was condemned. I'm alive because your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. In our hymn, The Love of God, greater than tongue can or pen could ever tell, could we with the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe, 
We couldn't write about the love of God. It would drain the ocean dry. The love of God is so great. And the beautiful thing is there's no need for anyone to perish. A way has been made. And it's as simple to understand as the faith it took to look to the bronze serpent that was raised up in the desert. We must look to this offering that Jesus made himself on the cross. Have you made that decision? Do you have within you an assurance that you too will be accepted in the beloved? And that day comes when Jesus comes again and everyone will stand before him. Have you made that decision to put your faith in Jesus and that offering that he made for us? There's much more in this passage that I'll get to in another week, but we'll reserve the rest of our time for our communion. But let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this passage of Scripture. The most wonderful section maybe in the whole Bible that tells us about the incredible love of God and what it takes to be saved. I pray, Father, that each and every one in this auditorium today has wrestled with this and made a decision within their heart to put their trust in you, O oh Lord, that they might have the assurance of eternal life. And I thank you again for this. In Jesus' name, amen.